Good evening, everybody. Um, tonight, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 14. So if you haven't already, there's some handouts in the back of the room that I think are going to be really helpful as we go through this study. Um, and Michael will not be with us tonight. He had to put his dog that he's had since puppy to sleep last night. And so he's very, very emotional. He said, I'm ready for it, Mom. No, he wasn't. So um, just keep him in prayer because, you know, he last thing he needs is to stress about something else. So um, tonight, as we move forward, we'll pray for Michael and whoever else. The, the office has a lot of the prayer requests, and they pray over them every Tuesday. Um, but if you are visiting us online, we appreciate you being here with us. It is exciting that you are. Drop us a note in the comments. Um, also, you can go to CreeksideCB backslash connect, and you can fill out a connect card. We'd love to be in touch with you. So um, since Michael won't be here, it's probably a good thing because a lot there's a lot to teach tonight in this chapter, background stuff that will help you understand the significance of what is going on. And as I've said before, I love the Jewish teachings that bring what the Jewish people understood to light in the messianic fulfillment of prophecy. So let's start with some prayer and then we'll go on from there. So, Father, tonight, I pray that you would anoint this word. Father, let it go out with power and authority. And, Lord, may we be amazed at how you have put all things together and work them out, Father, for just the right time. And, Lord, we thank you that we have your word to be able to understand it. And we have teachers of old that have shown us what this word could mean and how we can apply it to our lives. We ask you tonight to teach us tonight to apply this to our life and be amazed at who and what you are. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I gave you the slides that we're going to cover tonight and the handouts because there's a lot of information in these handouts that are really going to help you. So as an introduction, as we go into chapter 14, Jesus knows what he's going to face. He knows that his friends, the disciples that have been with him, are going to, at some point, they are going to desert him. They're not going to be there with him. He's got to go to the That the death is going to be for their sake. When Jesus died, it was for their sake and for ours. So I want you to think about the people in your life. Um, that you love more than anything, and some of them may be with you tonight, how would you respond to them if you knew in just a few hours that they would betray and abandon you? That's what Jesus knew. He knew that in just a few hours he would be abandoned and betrayed by some people that he loved the most. How would that make you feel? I mean, when you think about it, the hurt, um, that would be in your heart. And Jesus felt that as he was heading to the cross. And as you hold that response and those feelings in your mind, what does it say about Jesus' love for us that he wants to spend time with us despite what he knows about us? You know, if altars could speak, wouldn't it be amazing what they would say? The things that we've poured out on the altars to talk to God about, I mean, Jesus loves us despite all of that mess. Um, Mark takes us with Jesus right into the hardest part of Jesus' mission. And he has support for this mission up to a point. But again, he faces the cross alone. So we have to ask each other, are we lone rangers? I'm a lone person. I, I love to be by myself. I don't like to have problem solving from all kinds of people around me. It just muddles my thinking. Um, but are you a lone ranger, or do you prefer to face challenges with a group of people that can help you through those, um, a partner or a team? Um, which approach works better, in your opinion? Because Jesus and the Word had a lot to say about this. If you look at the Scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, Paul tells us, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. There's a togetherness there. In Ecclesiastic 4, verses 9 through 12, a very familiar scripture, two are better than one because they have a good reward. 
for their toll. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. And again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him, and therefore a cord is not quickly broken. Um, in Proverbs 27, it says, Iron sharpens iron. We know that. Togetherness. Matthew 8, 20, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Again, togetherness. Hebrews 10, verse 24 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. He tells us that we have to work together. Hey, Sarah. And Galatians 6, verse 2 says, To bear one another's burdens. And by doing that, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. So we're not designed to work alone. We're not designed to work through problems completely by yourself. And if you haven't, Sarah, there is a handout in the, in the back of the room if you want one. You got it? Great. Okay. So we should not toil alone. Um, in fact, pastor is going to be preaching about the book of Nehemiah and for the next few Sundays. And if you read that book or you are reading the book, you'll find out that Nehemiah did not build up the walls on his own. They worked together side by side in unity with minds toward the same mission. That's what we are supposed to be doing. Um, we are supposed to be encouraging each other and gathering wise counsel from each other and bearing one another's burdens. So be, that's what Jesus needed as he was heading for the cross. But the people that he loved and trusted the most were going to betray him because he had to face the cross alone. So before we start learning about Mark chapter 14 and everything that's in there, there's some background information we have to understand, and that is the two feasts that are discussed in Mark chapter 14, the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They have a lot of meat in them that will help you understand the behavior and the thoughts of Jesus as he's heading for this cross. So you have some handouts that talk about this. So when we think about the Exodus, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? When we talk about the Passover, I'm sorry. The blood over the doorposts. What else? Anything else that comes to mind? The Passover meal, any of that come to your mind? Well, the Passover feast is described in Exodus 20, or 12, I'm sorry. And it describes what the Jewish people were supposed to be doing with the Passover feast. But it also, we can link what that means for Jesus and the fulfillment of the Messianic prophecies and then how we can apply that to our lives today. So it's a historical event that actually took place, but it also fulfills prophecy. And it's about a way of escape. God provided a way of escape for the Jewish people from Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is a picture of sin today, but it provided a way of escape out of the trouble that was coming. So let's talk about what the Bible says about the Passover, because it is the way of escape. So if we go to Exodus, Exodus chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, you have that in your handout. It says, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month of your year. Jesus, or God had them change their calendar. So the, the month of Nisan became the first month in their spiritual calendar. So he changed that month of Nisan. And they do that to this day. They have two calendars. They have the, the Gregorian calendar that we have, but they also have their, their own calendar, their religious calendar, and they have different start and end points. So a question is, why would God do that? So uh, one way you can think of this is that from a spiritual point of view, when you come under the blood and you accept the blood of Jesus Christ to take away your sins, you are a new creation. Just as they, God made this a new start of their calendar, he made us a new creation. And so there's some practical application of why God did that. Does that make sense? Um, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, he said, Tell the whole community of Israel that on... The tenth day of this month, the month of Nisan, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Um, this shows that the Passover affects everyone, because he said everyone 
Every family should have a lamb to eat. Um, the Israelites knew what this meant, and God didn't have a plan B, right? He, this is what his plan was. He didn't have an alternate plan for them to do this. It was his way, and this affects everyone. And we see that it affects us today. Um, it was on the 10th day of the month of Nisan that the lamb was taken, and if you look at the fulfillment of Christ in this, Nisan day 10 was the day that Jesus presented himself to Israel by riding into Jerusalem on the donkey on the 10th of Nisan. Make sense? So in Exodus 12, verse 4, it says, If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are determined the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat because there was not to be any of the lamb left over. Why? They were to eat it all. Didn't Jesus give his all? So they were to eat it all. Um, and then, in fact, the rabbis told them that if you didn't have enough to feed, you were to call your neighbors in. So they made a, a, a kind of rule that, you know, between 10 and 20 people is what you needed to complete that whole lamb. Because one lamb, it, the lamb would always be sufficient to take care of sin, the lamb of God. But that lamb that they were eating was never going to be sufficient. So it had to be fulfilled differently. And it drives home the point that Jesus is the true lamb of God, right? And he gave his all, just as he said to eat all of the lamb. And then next it is 12.5. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. The animal was to be a male without defect. And we know the fulfillment of that in Jesus as he was the sinless man, the sinless son of God. He had no defect. Um, in fact, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 15, he talks about this. Um, the book of Romans tells us about that. For if many died by the trespass of one man, how much more of God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. The scripture had to be fulfilled by a man that was sinless. And can you imagine if Jesus had committed one sin, he would not have been able to pay the price for us. He was tempted in all things, just like us. But he didn't give in to the sin. And without that, without what he had put himself through, and his commitment to, to the cross, things could have been completely different for us. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 6, it says, Take care of them, that lamb, until the 14th day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. So the people picked out their lamb, and they had to take care of it for those days. They had to inspect that lamb from the 10th to the 14th of Nisan. Could you imagine have a lamb in your house with your children? for four days, and they were taking care of it and how beautiful that lamb was, only to find out that was going to be the sacrifice. I mean, I grew up on a farm, and I hated it when we had to slaughter a goat or a pig or a cow, um, you know, because you became friends with those animals and those children. That They knew the story. They knew the story, and they knew what they were supposed to do. It would be killed at twilight. Um, and there's a Bible commentary that says this, that twilight is between the sun's decline and the sunset. So in their time frame, it was between 3 and 5 p.m. So in the fulfillment of this, Jesus died on the 14th of Nisan. So for those between the 10th and 14th, there was a lot of things happening that we're going to discuss. But he actually died on the 14th of Nisan at the exact time that the lamb was supposed to be slaughtered in accordance with the fulfillment of the scripture. Um, and they had to they were told exactly how to slaughter that lamb. And so we have to understand that we were just as involved in the death of Jesus as the Roman and the Jews because our sin was placed on him. So what he did at the cross wasn't just because the Jews did it and the Romans did it. We also were part of that crucifixion. And Exodus 12, verse 7 says, then they are to take some of the blood, like Tim said, and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lamb. So when the lamb is dead, the people had to do two things. They had to apply the blood onto the door frames of their house, and there's a lot of Jewish teaching about that hyssop and what that all meant. And they had to eat the lamb. 
So Jesus died for everyone, but not everyone applies his blood to their life, right? Just like at that time, the death angel came and it passed over those who had the blood on the door. But yes, his blood is there, but not everybody partakes of that. Just as in that time, some did not do it, and as a result of that, death came. As it is today, if we don't accept Jesus and apply his blood to our life, if we don't do that, death, spiritual death, is bound to come. Make sense? And in Exodus 12, 8, it says that same night they are to eat the meat roasted over fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast, which was the leaven. And it had to be eaten that same night, for God's judgment and wrath was going to be poured out that night when they ate that. The, the death angel was going to come on the 14th of Nisan. It had to be eaten with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. And the bitter herbs reminded the Israelites and the Jewish people of the bitterness they experienced while they were in slavery in Egypt. And it reminds us of what our life was like before knowing Christ. That's what it should remind us of. The unleavened bread reminds us that Jesus was sinless and now we are unleavened in him. We no longer should have sin in our life. In Exodus 12, verses 9 through 10, and again, I'm going through this Passover information because you need to understand this before we go into Mark chapter 14. In Exodus 12, verses 9 through 10, it says, Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, the head, the legs, and the inner parts. Do not leave any of it until the morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. They had to roast it in fire because fire speaks of the judgment of God. And the fulfillment there was the, the judgment of God came upon Christ for our sins on the cross. And when he talked about you have to eat the head, the legs, and the inner parts, he was talking about our thought life in our head. You know, the things that come in temptation always starts with a thought. And when he's talking about our legs, he's talking about our works and our actions and our strength. Tim's got a little less of that today, but that's okay. Um, and then the, utter, the inner parts talks about our soul, our heart, our, all the things that come together with our emotions. Imagine that, and it's all fulfilled in what God told them. They had to make sure that they consumed. So the fires of wrath burned out on the cross for all of us at that time. Um, and we have to place our trust in him, or that fire of wrath will come upon us and all those that do not accept Jesus. And then in Exodus 12, verse 11, he said, this is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, and your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And if you knew what they dressed like, they tucked that cloak into their belt because when they ran, they couldn't, you know, you can't run real fast if you got a dress on. And that's basically what it was. So for the Israelites, the Passover was eaten in haste because they were to quickly leave Egypt and, and depart on their journey. And the fulfillment we have today is we have to realize that believing and partaking of Christ begins a whole new journey for us. We are not to stay where we were. We are to move on to something different because, again, we are a new creation. It's the new life that we are headed for. Just as they headed for the promised land, once we do this, we are headed for a new life in Christ. And Exodus 12, 12 says, On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. So what does that mean? In Egypt, if you didn't have the blood applied over your door, that the firstborn in that household was going to die. Well, the firstborn, you have to wonder why he said that. Because in the Bible, the firstborn often speaks of the natural fleshly birth in comparison to our second spiritual birth. Because we do have a second spiritual birth, right? The first birth was our natural birth. But our spiritual birth is what matters the most to us. So the point is that we must be born again, and that's what this is talking about. Um, in Exodus 12, 13, he talks about the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. 
Um, in the days of the Exodus, the death angel came and passed over all that had the blood on their door frames, very familiar to us. And death came to those who weren't under the blood, both the children, the firstborn, and the animals. So we have to note that this salvation from the angel of death didn't come down to our own personal worthiness. The death angel didn't come only to those who were unworthy. This has nothing to do with our worthiness. He came to all who did not have the blood on applied to them. We have to understand that same thing. We will never be worthy enough to have Jesus in our life, but he doesn't come because of our worthiness. He comes because we've applied the blood to our lives. It has nothing to do with how worthy we are, and that's what we see in here. Only the lamb is worthy, and the lamb wants you, and the lamb wants me. And in Exodus 12, 14, he said, This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come, and you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord and a lasting ordinance. God wanted this day to be celebrated. So each year between the 10th and 14th of Nisan, this feast is celebrated. But it's a rehearsal. It's a shadow of things that are to come because it is, in, it is reality that in Christ, it's a point to the true Passover. He was and is our Passover lamb. So although they have done this all through this time frame when the Lord told them to change and, and take the Passover meal, the Jewish people are still doing this today. They're still doing it today. But it marks a shadow of what was to come, and that was Christ fulfilling that. He is the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. So they have a setter meal. Have you ever participated in a setter meal? during the Passover. Oh, it's nasty. Yes, and the bitter herb. Yeah, it's, it's a horrible meal, right? It's everything I can do to choke it down. But there's a reason why it's like that, right? There's a reason why it is. So it's the setter meal is an order of arrangement. It's given to the Jewish as a traditional observance of the Passover feast. It's generally a 15-step process, and you'll find that 15-step process in your, ha in your handout. Um, but today, let's draw your attention that during the Passover meal, there are four cups. And Jesus talked about those cups, if you remember what Scripture talks about. So there's a book called The Seven Festivals of the Messiah, and it's written by Edward Chumney. And he says, during the course of the setter, the four cups of wine that are served to the people present at the setter meal are used in the following manner. And this is important to understand. Number one is the cup of blessing. And you'll find that in Luke chapter 22 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's called also the cup of sanctification or the Kadesh. So there's a reason for that cup. So when they drink that cup, they're remembering that there is a blessing. God blesses them. And then the second cup is the cup of wrath. This cup is normally not drank. It's poured out as God pours out his wrath. Make sense? But I want you to understand that Jesus drank that cup of wrath during that meal. He's the only one that can actually drink that cup of wrath for us, right? Because the wrath was going to be poured out on him. Um, the cup of blessing, salvation, or redemption, it's filled to overflowing, symbolizing an overflowing of the Holy Spirit and salvation. I think that's really cool. And then the last cup, if you remember, Jesus said, I will not drink of this cup again until you see me in the kingdom. It's because it's called the kingdom cup. He spoke of eating and drinking afresh in the messianic age. He couldn't drink of it because his kingdom had not yet come. But we will take of that cup when we all get to heaven. So it's very interesting when he talks about these things. Um, remember, he during that meal, he broke the bread and he gave thanks. And that's going to be something that we're going to talk about because it's very important to understand what they did. Then they sang a hymn, and we're going to cover that. And we're actually going to listen to the Hallel, which is the hymn they sang on the night of the, of the Passover meal. So that's the first feast that he talks about, the Passover feast. I hope that helps you a little better understand that. Um, we covered it really in depth during our women's meeting, didn't we, Bev? And we really talked a lot about it. Um, so everything starts with the Passover. Remember, he made it their first month. Everything starts with the Passover, and it's all about Jesus. It's not about the meal. It's about Jesus. So then the next thing he talks about is the feast of unleavened bread. And this one just makes my spirit soar. 
uh, Feast of Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread are, they're done. The Passover is one day, and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread is begun on the next day. So in Exodus chapter 12, it continues, for seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your house. They started this process beforehand, just like you. Somebody told you about Jesus, some plant, some water, and some reap. But they prepared this stuff in advance, just as Jesus was prepared in advance to be our propitiation for sin. This Feast of Unleavened Bread is just amazing. Um, so you aren't to work. It goes from the evening of the 14th. Remember, the Jewish time frame went from 6 a.m. or 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. to 5 p.m. They started their day at night. So it was to be on the 14th at night. So that would be considered the 15th of Nisan. And it went for seven days to the 21st day. That's when the Feast of Unleavened Bread took place. So um, we know that it began the day after Passover. And we know by name that it's about unleavened bread. So what does leaven mean? What do we know leaven means? It symbolizes what? Sin, right? Have you ever made bread? Because when you put that yeast in, what does it do? It activates with the, with the sugar, and it starts to puff itself up, you know? And that's what sin will do in our life. A little bit changes everything. So there was a lot the word has to say about leaven. It's a fungus. Believe it, it's a fungus. And it causes the dough to rise. And we know that several times in the Bible, including Paul, taught that a little bit will leaven the whole loaf. It doesn't take much to make it um, puff up. So Paul said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He said, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? And he told us to clean out the leaven so that you may be a new lump in Christ, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So he, we are to use our sinless life when we can be. I mean, it's hard to be sinless, let's be honest. None of us have go through life without sinning, even after we come to Christ. But it's, it's clear that this is a type of sin. And we know that. He uses that because the properties, they spread and they influence. Yeast spreads and influences everything around it. And when you, I love the first scripture in Psalms where it goes from this. It talks about when you, um, you stand and listen and then you sit in the counsel of the wicked. It goes through a process. You're walking by and you hear something and your ear gets a little tickled, and then you have to stand there and listen to it, or you, and then you wind up sitting down, and then you're fully consumed in it. Well, leaven will do that. You know, that it, it spreads. Sin spreads in your life. I mean, sometimes we get a little calloused about it. Um, but we know that he talks a lot about leaven and its use and its, and its uh, comparison to sin. So there are... There are some things that the scripture talks about leaven, and we learned about them earlier. The, Jesus talked about the leaven of the Pharisees. Remember that? The leaven of the Pharisees was hypocrisy. They say one thing, but they live another way. That was the leaven of the Pharisees. The leaven of the Sadducees, is they were spiritual skeptics. Remember, they didn't believe in angels nor life after death. They didn't believe in resurrection. And so they were spiritual skeptics while they maintained a show of religiosity. That was the leaven of the Sadducees. And then the leaven of Herod, we talked about that too. Um, there are several warnings when he talks about the leaven of Herod. One is against the desire for worldliness and power that easily spreads. And the other is wanting to see spiritual signs. Remember, Herod wanted him to perform for him. He wanted him to perform a miracle for him. That was the leaven of Herod. But Paul added some leaven Things. Paul added the leaven, leaven of legalism. How many of us have ever been brought under that construct, the level of legalism? Boy, was I raised under that. Um, and then the leaven of morality. 
And so many times in today's world, they take the immorality and they change it. But you have to look at what those words meant in the Greek and in the Hebrew to understand exactly what he was talking about. I mean, they lived in a, a world of immorality then. So do we. So do we. And then um, we go on to know that because the Passover took place, that he was sacrificed, that Jesus not only was the Passover lamb, but he is, on our, he is our unleavened bread. It talks about Jesus as this sinless, no leaven in him, sinless. So Jesus fulfills that. Um, and he talks a lot about it in the scripture. But let's go through what the Jewish observance of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the personal application. So I love this part of it. This is what Chomney talks about in his book. The preparation for searching and removing the leaven from the house actually begins before Passover. Again, that preparation. Some water, some plant, some reap. First, the wife thoroughly cleans the house to remove all leaven from it. And then, in the, this is a symbol of sin. Remember that, leaven is. And in cleaning the house, the wife is instructed to purposely live. They are to purposely leave 10 pieces of, of leavened bread in the house, 10 small pieces. Then the father takes the children. This is a great way to teach kids because they involve the children in this festival. Then the father takes the children along with a candle and a wooden spoon, a feather, and a piece of linen cloth. What do those have in common? So he takes those things and he searches throughout the house for the 10 pieces of leaven. And by nightfall on the day before Passover, they do a final and comprehensive search for the leaven. And at this time, the house is completely dark except for the candles. And once the father finds the leaven, he sets the candle down by the leaven and lays the wooden spoon beside the leaven. I want you to get this. Then he uses the feather to sweep that leaven onto the spoon. And without touching the leaven, he takes the feather, the spoon, and the leaven and he wraps them in a linen cloth, and he casts them out of the door of the house. And the next morning on the 14th day of Nisan, which is the Passover, he goes into the synagogue, and he puts the linen cloth and its contents in the fire to be burned. There is so much symbolism in this. So I want you to look at this. Um, the personal ongoing aspect of this feast is expressed by Jesus being our unleavened bread. Um, he is sanctified. He is holy. And we are supposed to walk like that in sanctification and holiness. And we keep this feast by constantly searching in our heart and getting rid of the leaven. We get rid of the sin in our lives. So what do the candle and the spoon and the linen and the feather mean? Well, the candle, is, it symbolizes the word of God, right? It lights your path. It symbolizes the word of God. Um, and the work of the Holy Spirit is symbolized by the feather because what do we think of when we see, when we hear of the Holy Spirit? We think of a dove, right? So the feather it symbolizes the Holy Spirit. And then um, the spoon is a symbol of the cross, the wooden cross that Jesus would be nailed to. The linen symbolizes when Jesus was in the tomb, he was wrapped in linen. Do you see the correlation there? I think this is so cool. So you see all the elements there of, of, the, of the unleavened bread. So Jesus also did something. Did Jesus actually uh, adhere to this feast? Well, what does Jesus call the temple? He called it his father's house. And remember, they were to get all the leaven out of their home. Remember, there were two times when Jesus went into the temple and he got the people out of there. Remember the money changers and those that were selling things that they shouldn't have been selling? When do you think that happened? It happened in preparation for removing the leaven from his father's house. And so in the word, it tells you that it happened around Passover. In both, and then in Mark, right before Jesus goes to the cross, this same thing happened. He went into the temple and he cleared it out. We talked about that a few weeks. He took those whips and he cleared out the temple and got rid of the leaven out of his father's house. That's the spiritual thing that you can see. So did Jesus 
celebrate this when he was ready to go to the cross? Absolutely, he celebrated it by going to his father's house and getting rid of the leaven. So it's, it's easy to read that without understanding what he was doing. But the part that really thrills me is the afikomen. The afikomen is so neat. What they do in the home is they take three pieces of matzah bread. You know what matzah bread looks like? You'll see a picture of it in your slide. But the matzah bread is that unleavened bread. It looks like crackers. And it has holes in it where it's been pierced. And it has stripes where it's been baked. What does that remind you of? By his, yeah, he was pierced for our transgressions. And by his stripes, we are healed. So that matzah bread symbolizes Jesus. But they take three pieces of matzah bread and they put it into a linen cloth. Okay, What do those three pieces symbolize? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, what they do is they take out the second piece of the matzah and they wrap, they break it in half and they put it into a linen cloth. What does that symbolize? His body is broken for us, right? He did that. His body is broken for us, and that is just amazing. And then, and then when they, at the end of it, they eat, they break that piece of the other half of the matzah bread, they break it into pieces, and they consume it. Just like Jesus said at the last Passover meal, this is my body. He broke it, and he, he asked them to eat it. They talk about the loaves in, in the uh, Passover meal and the unleavened bread feast when Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross. But that second piece of bread, that second piece of matzah is broken into pieces and we are to consume it. And what you need to know is every time we take communion, think of that afikoman, you know, where he took that piece of bread out, that cracker out, and it was broken and then consumed. And it should mean a whole lot more to us when we take communion to know that that's what they were doing as they celebrated unleavened bread. And this is the sorts of things that were happening in Mark chapter 14 as we enter in to look at that. So we know that unleavened bread points to Jesus. He is the bread of heaven. How many times did he tell us that? He is the bread of heaven. And he showed that by going to the cross for us. So let's go into Mark chapter 14. And you can read those handouts, and I think it will really help you understand a little bit more. And that afikomen in the Greek, the meaning of it is debated. Some call it dessert. <laughs> That's interesting. But it actually means the coming one, that second piece of bread. Think about that, how it's so precise what God showed them to do and how it points to Jesus. Um, so now that we have a little bit of understanding about these feasts, and you can read about them more in your handout, let's go into chapter 14. So chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, it says this. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Remember, Passover, and then immediately follows the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take Jesus by trickery and put him to death. By trickery. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. So this timing is significant. Notice, it was during the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, there was great expectation of the Messiah during these time frames because that, that afikomen, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Passover, they knew it pointed toward the Messiah. They just didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And Jerusalem was crowded with people, remember, during the Passover. If you were within 15 miles as a male, you were, you were required to come to the temple to observe these things. And people came from miles away to celebrate the Passover and unleavened bread in Jerusalem. Even people in Galilee that grew up with Jesus would come to Jerusalem. So they celebrated this because it was God's command that they celebrate the Passover and unleavened bread. So every possible preparation was made for the Passover. A month ahead of time, the Passover was explained in each synagogue and Jewish schools taught what it meant, so everybody was prepared for it. Boy, that's, that's a whole mouthful. You can preach on that for a while, the preparation that went into it. Every tomb was whitewashed white. Why do you think that was? It's really interesting. 
What if you were coming into Jerusalem and accidentally rubbed against a tomb of someone who had died? What would that make you? Unclean. Therefore, you couldn't celebrate the Passover or unleavened bread. You would have to go through a cleansing ritual first. So they would whitewash the tombs so that people could see them and not accidentally touch something that had died. (laughs) That's a lot right there. So they did this. They prepared for it. Um, but they said they, they were planning on how they might take him for, through trickery. You know, could they trick him into coming in? Um, they plotted the murder of Jesus ahead of time. They didn't even fear God. Think about that. They were plotting the murder, and they knew a lot of what Jesus had been teaching was truth. They knew the scriptures, so they were plotting to kill this man. They feared the people, but they didn't fear killing the Son of God. They feared the people lest there be an uproar of the people. They didn't want to do it during the feast because they were afraid of what the people might do. They were not afraid to murder the Son of God, but they were afraid of the people of the city of Jerusalem. They were trying to do a politically smart thing. That'll preach in today's world. So they said, not during the feast. They did not want to kill Jesus during the Passover, but they ended up doing it anyway. Right? They wanted to take, they said not during the feast, but it happened anyway. These men that plotted against Jesus were up against prophecy and God himself and putting these things together. There's nothing they could do to stop what was going to happen. Jesus was in command of his own death. Amazing. They originally, and you can read about this in the book of John, they originally planned to seize Jesus during the feast, But when they saw the popularity of Jesus during the triumphal entry, they knew better. He was very popular during that triumphal entry, remember? But they chose not to do it then because, again, they were afraid of the people. Then their plan changed when Judas, someone he loved and was going to betray him, he arranged a private meeting with them. Everything changed, right? So then we go to verse 3. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask, a very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. First of all, let's talk about the house of Simon the leper. Would Jesus have gone to a house with a man who was full of leprosy during this time frame? No, it would have made him unclean. Simon the leper is believed by... um, Bible commentaries to be the man that Jesus cleansed of leprosy back in the beginning of the chapter of Mark. He cleansed him of leprosy and he told him to go and present himself to the the priests for cleanliness rituals. And he is the father of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Did you know that? And he wasn't a leper, just like we call blind Bartimaeus, right? He wasn't blind. He'd been healed of it, but we recognize when they talk about blind Bartimaeus, we recognize who he once was and who he is now, just like Simon the leper. Jesus did not go into the house of a man who had active leprosy. It's just that it's easier to recall who he is by calling him Simon the leper. So who was the woman that poured out this oil that he's talking about? It's Mary. No, it's Mary, the brother of Lazarus and Martha. How do we know that? Because the scripture tells us in another book of the gospel. It's Mary that did it. She is the one. There are two times when oil is poured out upon Jesus, right? Don't confuse this with the one where she broke the alabaster box, the woman did, and poured it on his feet and wiped it with her hair. That's not this time. This is right before his death when she broke this oil and poured it upon his head. This is different than with the original one. So, um, John talks about this in John chapter 12, and that's where we find out that it's Mary of Bethany, which is Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, as you know them, the sister of Lazarus and Martha. Um, so you, you understand now the connection between them? And remember, this is a very rich and influential family. You know, these were friends of Jesus. Um, and it wasn't that same event as that sinful woman. It's just, this is totally different, and a lot of people confuse them. And we do not know that that was Mary Magdalene that did it. We don't know that. You know, they don't name the woman. 
So this alabaster flask of very costly oil was an extravagant display of devotion to Jesus. It really was. Spices and ointments were used in investments. They were small, they were portable, and easily sold. In fact, uh, olive oil was so common in Jerusalem that it was used as a form of currency. But this is a different kind of oil. Um, she broke the flask and poured it on his head. It was a small bottle with a dab of oil in it. And here she went much further than just the customary greeting she poured. Because what the, the custom was when somebody came into your home, you, you anointed their head with oil. We see that happening when we pray for people, right? But she went further here. She poured the entire flask upon his head. Big time difference. Um, it's wonderful. And this was a very perceptive ask. Of, in fact, she sat and listened to Jesus when he taught, right? Remember the story. Martha was all upset because she was doing all the work, but Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and learned. And very clearly, she heard what he was teaching, and she knew that Jesus was getting ready to lay his life down because he'd been teaching about it, right? So she anointed his head with oil. And what does Jesus say about that? You know, he tells us that she anointed him for burial. And shouldn't it be that a king should be anointed? How many times do we find in the Old Testament where a king was anointed? And here we see the king being anointed by this flask of oil. And she did it without a word. So we don't see Martha. We don't see Lazarus in this story. We just see Mary anointing Jesus. And when she was finished, she didn't look to the disciples and ask them what they thought. She just poured the oil out. So this is really interesting what she did. Um, let's talk about some anointing oil. And the most common oil, again, I said that in Israel, was olive oil. Um, and oil was used for sacred events when the priests were anointed and when the kings were anointed. Um, the pouring of the oil over God's chosen, the representatives that God chose in the Bible, had significance. So when she... Mary anointed the head of Jesus. It was very significant because that jar of oil had value and a lot of value. Um, Jesus had been identifying himself all throughout the book of Mark as the son of God. He told them over and over again. He'd been, he'd been you know, telling people and he was revealing himself of that. Mary heard that and she believed it. She believed in who he was. So he was on the cusp of his crucifixion, and she anointed him. Um, here's the reaction in verses 4 through 9. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me, for you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have with you always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And every one of you recognize this event, right? Um, those were indignant. Some were indignant. Who was that specifically who began the indignant reaction? In John chapter 12, it tells us that it was Judas who began that kind of revolt about what she did. He was indignant about the expense. Why? Why do you think he was worried about the expense? What was Judas? Which, and also what? And he was a thief. He was a thief. He was a thief, and Jesus knew it, and he still called him. That's amazing. That is amazing. But they criticized her sharply. And it's easy to criticize those who did good works. It's easy to criticize those who were gone all out for Jesus. It really is. But it wasn't just Judas that criticized her. He started it, but the word says that they criticized her sharply. How easy is it for us to to get involved with someone who's been offended and they gather other people to come along beside their offense. So when they heard Judas criticizing her, they, the other disciples, came along beside that and criticized her as well. 
Each one looked at that oil on Jesus' head, and they considered it wasted, wasted. Now, here's a great word study. The word translated as wasted in this scripture in Mark is translated as perdition. Who started the criticism? Judas. What is Judas called? The son of perdition. Isn't that a neat word study there? But in John chapter 17, it's applied to Judas. Judas criticized Mary for wasting money. But when they talk about John in, uh, Judas in John chapter 17, the word is used there again, and it's talking about he wasted his whole life. It's really a neat word study, and words matter in the Bible, and, and word studies are great. And when they talked about they could have sold it for 300 denarii, this alabaster flask must have been worth more than a year's wages for a labor. So we have to understand that alabaster. If you do a study on anointing oil, it was the alabaster box did something to that oil, the preserving of it, and you just like, you know, wine skins do for wine and you know how you ferment kimchi, heaven forbid, I can't stand that stuff. Lived in Korea and never touched it. Um, but you know that stuff that they, they, the things, the carriers of things matter. And the alabaster box had a meaning to it. So Jesus told them to let her alone. And why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. And here is another word study. The, stipple, the, the, the disciples thought that this was a waste by anointing him with all this oil. Do you know that that alabaster box with the oil in it was an inheritance that was given to her? She spent her entire inheritance on Jesus. Remember when Jesus was in the temple and he saw the woman give the two mites of money and he said she has given her all? Here Mary poured out that oil and it was part of her inheritance and she gave it to Jesus. She gave her all. So in the Greek there are two words for good. There is agathos, which describes something that is morally good. And then there is kalos, K-A-L-O-S, which describes a thing that is morally good, but also beautiful or lovely. And he uses this word kalos when he describes that she has done something good. It was beautiful, it was lovely, and it was morally correct. So he gave her the highest compliment. She has done what she could. She gave her all. And God expects no more from us to do what we can. Right? And we make excuses for not doing what we can all the time. You know, I don't have time. Um, we need people to help with the car show. They still need people to sign up. So do what you can. Give it your all. Nobody expects you to do over and abundant and wear yourself out doing things, but do what you can and help out. And you can do that today by signing up to help out at the car show. Just as simple as that. So there is no higher commendation than Jesus said, you did all that you could. So she has come beforehand to anoint his body for burial. So it was all the more precious because it was planned. She came beforehand. And this was a spontaneous moment where she seized it, but she planned it beforehand. Remember, I told you, she listened to the teaching of Jesus. And so she knew what she was going to do. You know, and what happened? She was criticized for doing what she was doing. So never feel um, less than when you're criticized for doing something for Jesus. I get it all the time. I can tell you right now, my family just, they drive me crazy with the criticisms. But it doesn't matter because someday Jesus is going to tell me that what I did was kalos. It was all I could give, and it was beautiful. That's why we need to think of it. Think of it that way as you're doing something for Jesus. So that he anointed, when people are buried, they're anointed with oil. And she anointed his body for burial. And wherever she goes in the world, remember, anywhere the gospel is preached, what she did is discussed. And he said that, he prophesied that. Wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, she will be remembered for what she did. It's amazing what she did. And as you study that out, if you have time, about the alabaster box and the oil that she used and what happened as a result of that, the prophecy that was fulfilled, it's amazing. And it just makes the scripture come alive for me. This is why I love the scripture. You know, you dig out the truth, but you have to go back to the customs and understand why they did what they did. And it became a memorial to her. 
See, the disciples longed for fame and influence. Remember as they were walking, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, and they were arguing over that? They wanted fame and they wanted influence, but they didn't get that. Mary got fame and influence by the simple act of anointing Jesus' head. So those that are seeking fame and influence often don't find it. And those that are just doing things out of the goodness of their heart, people remember those things. So it doesn't matter. You don't have to be a showboat for Jesus. You just have to love on people and love what you're teaching them, and they're going to remember that. Remember, some plant, some water, and some are going to reap the benefits of that. So that's what was going on here. And I love that part about it. So let's end up with these last few verses. It's in verses 10 through 11. Um, Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. He was one of the 12. Many speculate on the motive of Judas. Why did he do it? We speculate on that. Maybe his feelings were hurt. Who knows? Maybe it was greed. We don't really know. But we do know he was influenced by the power of Satan to do what he did, right? But it makes it clear in in Matthew chapter 26 that Judas bargained with these religious leaders for the life of Jesus. It wasn't a simple, you give me this. He bargained for the life of Jesus. Um, He asked them, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? That's a specific act of bargaining over the life of Jesus. Um, So certainly part of his motivation was just plain out pure greed plain out pure greed. And so whatever his motive was, it was his motive. We won't know that. Um, But God used the willing Satan who influenced a willing Judas to fulfill his will. You have to be willing. Whether you're willing to do good or whether you're willing to do evil, you have to be willing to do it. And Satan found a willing partner to work with him. So when they heard it, they were glad. The religious leaders, they had wanted to destroy Jesus, right? They wanted to get rid of him, and they wanted to do it for a long time. We learned about that back in Mark chapter 3. But now they had an ally and a disciple, one of his inner circle, that was going to betray him. And there's not one person who hasn't suffered from betrayal from somebody that you love, somebody that's close to you. If you haven't experienced that, you're blessed. But Jesus experienced it just like we did. Remember, he was tempted of all things. He felt everything we feel, and yet he still went to the cross for us. So it's 8 o'clock, and we're going to pick this back up again next week. I hope that this helped you a little bit, especially understanding the feasts and what all this means as we study this out, and we'll finish. This is a long chapter in Mark chapter 14. There's 66 verses, I believe. It's a long chapter, so we'll be here for a little while, and we'll park there for a bit. But I hope it helps you understand just who Jesus is and what he did for us. Did you want to say anything, Pastor?